I've been struggling to find an identity for this channel, and if I'm being quite honest, I still don't really know what that is, or what I want to do, or what works for me. Even after all the videos I've done to the best of my ability, I still feel like something's missing. So I took time away from it all just to try and figure out what I'm most passionate about. I mean, I'm obviously passionate about movies, but it's more than that. But then, it hit me. I don't just like talking about movies, but I also love talking about the inner workings in terms of how they're made. So then I asked myself, what's the most important when making a film? Well, you need cameras, proper lighting, costumes, sets, props, etc depending on what genre you're working with. But you also need a trustworthy crew in those departments and a cast of talented actors. But most importantly, even more important than even the producer and the director, you need the script. The script is the main blueprint to making any film in any genre. Without this, the movie wouldn't even exist in the first place. And being an amateur screenwriter myself, I decided to read as many as I can in order to improve and master my craft. At least that's the advice that was given to me by other screenwriters. And being an amateur screenwriter myself, I decided to read as many as I can in order to improve and master my craft. At least that's the advice that was given to me by other screenwriters. And what better way to read these scripts than to also watch the movies made from them? Which, of course, was also advice I got from screenwriters. Throughout the past few months, that's what I've been doing for a while. I've read at least four or five, and they've really intrigued me in terms of how they put all this together into one big movie. And with that, a new segment was born. I present to you my newest segment I like to call Script vs. Screen. So before I came up with this segment, my original plan was simply just to learn how to write action scripts, since I was writing one of my own. And with the advice that I found online, I was told to look up PDF files online of written scripts from Hollywood. And there, I found an article about the top 10 lists of scripts to choose from that were in the category of the action genre. And one script that actually stood out to me the most was one of my favorite action movies of all time, John Wick. So I downloaded the file, excited to sit down and read it. Now I've already seen the movie twice before, so I kinda already had an idea of what was in store for me. Or so I thought. As I was reading through the first few pages, I realized that the intro was vastly different from what I remember, which really threw me off. Did I watch the same movie as what was written here? So that's when I decided to go back and watch the film while also reading the script. And boy, did I find some interesting shit. Not only did I find things in the script that are vastly different from the original film, but neither the script nor the film have the same title. Instead of it being called John Wick, it's called Scorn. Like, like what the hell, am I in the freaking Twilight Zone? What is this shit? So after reading through the script and watching the movie at the same time, I thought seeing these differences would be interesting enough to share with my viewers, thus creating this new segment. In this segment, we'll basically be looking at both the script and the film and, and see through any account which is better, the script or the film. Let's find out on this first episode of Script vs. Screen featuring John Wick. Now just to be clear, I'm not going to read the entire script to you guys. I'm simply just going to bring out some lines, some headings, some actions from the script, just a few at a time, and compare them to the final cut of the film. But you are free to download the file on your own and simply read those excerpts along with me, or you can download it and read it and watch the film on your own and then come back to the video later. Or you can simply just sit back, relax, and enjoy the video as it stands without doing either of the two. Either way, we're going to have a great time. So without further ado, let's begin. So for people who watch this movie, you know this movie starts off with John Wick pretty much bleeding to death and nearly falling unconscious after watching a video of his dead wife. To realize that it flashes back to him at his house in a rich fancy little mansion and it's clean, spick and span, kind of just to show that he's alone in this world. However, it's actually the complete opposite on the script. In fact, he actually lives in a farmhouse that's actually a lot smaller, more classic. Some of the paint is chipped on the wood, and it's almost as if it's abandoned. I mean, you still see John Wick waking up in the morning. The difference is, John Wick is actually much older in the script. As you can see here, it says salt and pepper hair, which indicates the fact that, he's, that he has gray hair. That's, that's the weird thing to me. Like, John Wick was supposed to be older in this story. 
like much older, like Jeff Bridges old, or maybe not that old, but like old enough to be someone in the 60s. Instead, they got Keanu Reeves in his in his early 50s. Specifically, the character was supposed to be at least 61 years old, based on the script here. You see that later if you read it for yourself. But when they were filming this movie, Keanu Reeves was actually 49 when he did this. If you do the math, the first movie came out in 2014, but they probably filmed it back in like 2012, so Keanu Reeves had to be a bit younger than 52, which is the age he was when the movie came out in, in October of 2014. I mean, I guess they couldn't find someone who was actually in their 60s to actually pull off the same stunts that Keanu Reeves did, so I guess I can understand why they made the change, so it's not really that hard-pressing or that big of a deal. It's just something I find pretty interesting. Although Screenwriting 101 has always taught me, never to start your script with someone waking up in the morning. And John Wick, one of the most famous franchises of all time, started off with that in a script. And it still managed to make a huge profit. I guess anything's possible. You know, fuck the rules. Do whatever you want with the script. Moving on. Now the rest of this sequence is pretty much the same. Both in the movie and the script, he goes to the hospital and sees his wife for the last time before she passes away due to a terminal illness. But instead of going to that long-awaited funeral with William Defoe, he actually goes back home and sits in his basement, which is actually cleaner than the rest of his house based on the script here. He takes a healthy dose of alcohol and smokes an old pack of cigarettes and just kind of hangs out and just kind of loathes by himself most of the time. Now the sequence in the script here is pretty much the same as it is in the movie. He gets a knock on the door, he signs a few papers for a package he never really asked for, and turns out it's the dog that Norma sent him, along with the letter, pretty much showing her last dying wish. Now here in the script it's written a lot differently than it is said in the movie, so I'm guessing someone had to rewrite that somewhere. Also the name of the dogs are different too. In the script, the the dog's name is Moose, but in the movie, the dog's name is Daisy. Of course. Now about the same thing happens here with both the script and the movie, when he goes to the gas station, he gets gas, and he runs into Yosef, who brags about his ride and tries to bribe it off of him. And of course, he refuses and actually ends up riding riding around, drifting around in the airfield. Although both sequences happen kind of out of order. Not that it really matters that much, but it's just something I wanted to point out. So then we go on a few more pages in the script, pretty much matching up what happens in the movie. He gets robbed by Yosef and his crew, they beat him up, they kill his dog, they steal his car, and they bring it into John Leguizamo's character, Auto Shop. When John Leguizamo realizes whose car that is, he rejects to do a paint job for it and punches Yosef in the face, basically causing them to run off with the car. John eventually shows up on a bus to find out where his car is and realizes it's not there. From that point, this is where the differences seem to come full force. And I'm going to go through them as simple as I can point out, so that you're not too confused. Starting with the fact that, that Aurelio tells John that it, the car might be in the Takeshi Automotive, which is a Japanese-owned auto, auto shop. From there on, there is actually a fight scene that ensues between John and the automotive people and he ends up killing two of them in the exact same scene. Until one of them finally spews out that, that Yosef is in the red circle, which if you've seen this movie, you're already familiar with. It's a nightclub. What's interesting here is that John Wick actually speaks Japanese in this scene. And I was, and I was thinking like, I would have loved to hear Keanu Reeves speak in Japanese. That would have been pretty freaking awesome. I mean, we didn't get that until the fourth movie, which is a pretty long time from when this movie comes out to the fourth one, so, but I mean, you know, better late than never, I guess. So now we get to the point where, v where Vigo calls Aurelio asking why he struck his son, and then he tells him that because he messed with John Wick, and he's like, oh, right. Which is basically copy and paste in terms of what's being said from the, sc from the script to the movie. And Vigo meets up with his son, Yasef, scolding him for what he did to John Wick, knowing that he's going to get quite the beating once, once John Wick approaches him. He even goes as far as to explain why he's so dangerous. But instead of telling him that he saw he saw him kill three men with just a pencil, he actually tells him that when he was 15 years old, he lied his way into the Marines and headed off to Vietnam. He specialized in force-oriented reconnaissance, meaning that he crossed over into enemy territory to both collect information and should the opportunity present itself, fuck with the enemy in whatever way he saw fit. A little bit of a long way of saying he's dangerous in that he came from the army. He even goes as far as to ground his son inside of his penthouse 
as opposed to in the movie letting him go out freely and just do whatever he wants. John will come for you and you will do nothing because you can do nothing. So get the fuck out of my sight. <laughs> I think in the script it's a smarter way to go for the character Vigo because I mean it makes more sense that he wants to keep his son protected but in the movie he just he just lets him go like that that's that's her son dude you can't you're not just gonna let him die like that are you you know how dangerous Sean Wick is you're, you're not just gonna let him take that away take your son away from you are you I don't know I just felt that was kind of weird so then we get to the scene where he where John fights all the bad guys in his house. He sees Eduardo, who's supposed to be the cop, who pretty much turns a blind eye, and then Charlie comes in and cleans up everything. Pretty much the same in both the script and the movie. Nothing really to say here, so let's move on. It's from this point to where he checks into the hotel is, is where everything pretty much is the same. Vigo goes to Marcus and puts a bounty of $2 million on John Wick in order to protect his son, and John checks into the hotel with the manager played by Lance Riddick, rest in peace. But it actually happens out of order in the script as opposed to the movie. As the movie plays out, of course it's going to be different, but I like to go into more detail with it. So in the movie, he goes into the underground bar underneath the Continental where he meets Woodson, who is the owner of the Continental, and he asks where Vigo's son is, but he also tells him to be careful of going into this sort of criminal environment again, because people will be, be after him. He then immediately goes into, into the Red Circle looking for Yosef, and he finds him killing all of his guards in the process, but somehow doesn't manage to kill him, even though he's like point blank in his sights. Oh yeah, and he also kills Victor in the process, and, and steals his cell phone. And then he goes back to his hotel. So all that happens in the movie in that order. In the script, it's actually in a different order. He actually goes to the Red Circle first, then finds Victor and kills him on the spot, stealing his cell phone. Then he calls Yosef on Victor's cell phone, telling him that Victor is dead, and, and that he got his car back. But he's still coming after Yosef. Then he goes back to the Continental into the underground bar, where he finds Jenny, who's the who's the bartender. She even offers to sing a song sing a song for him that reminds him of his wife. So it's the same thing, it's essentially out of order. Which brings us to the scene where he meet, where John meets Jenny, who is the bartender and also a singer, and she offers to sing a song for John, which he agrees to. It happens to be an emotional scene where the song actually reminisces about him and his wife uh, dancing in the dance floor by themselves. And it's actually pretty sad and very, very sweet and endearing. And she sings the song, It Had To Be You, by Frank Sinatra. But it actually is a very touching, very, very emotional scene that wasn't in the movie. Thinking of what it added to his character, if they did add it, not really sure what effect it would have, even if whether they have it or they didn't have it. Either way, I think it's still a good scene. Now this is where things get a little more interesting. We meet the character Perkins in both the script and the movie. We meet her a little bit earlier in the lobby of the Continental, for only a brief moment and then also a brief moment inside the bar underneath the hotel. And finally, they confront each other inside John Wick's hotel and they have a fight scene together. Well, here's some differences in the script. It turns out, Perkins in the script is a guy. Late 20s, expensive tastes, and mostly cruel. And he's been stalking John ever since. At this point, we finally realize that John that John has been stalked by a guy named Perkins. And in the script, his name is David Perkins. Both the guy version and the woman version do confront John Wick in, a, in secrecy, trying to kill him inside of his hotel. In the movie, it was just Perkins herself, but in the script, it's Perkins and four other people. All five of them try to kill John Wick in one go, but they all fail miserably in a pretty gruesome fight scene in a pretty horrific and in an in a awesome way. I, I do have to admit though, it's a lot better than it is in the movie. Why? Because it, it actually leads to be a pretty gruesome and pretty violent in this scene more than it is in the movie. And the movie is just... Uh, yeah, it's kind of that. It's not a bad fight scene or anything, but in comparison to this and the script, I don't know, I just think it's... I think the script is a lot better than in this case. That's just me, though. If you read it for yourself, 
hopefully at least you get to see what I'm saying. You don't need necessarily have to agree with me, but I feel like there's more there's more going on in the script than there is in the movie. That's all I'm saying. Although now that I think about it, wouldn't John get in trouble for killing those guys in the Continental? Because he's in the Continental? Because that would be against the rules? Now nah, I'm just overthinking it. Let's move on. Okay, so moving on to a scene where we get to the bridge where John and Marcus meet each other. Which sounds pretty similar to what happens in the movie, even though in the movie it happens much later. Here it happens about smack dab in the middle of, of the story, about 71 pages in. In the script, John actually reflects on his decisions based on everything that's happened to him. And it actually brings up a pretty interesting bit of dialogue between him and Marcus. And it goes like this. What am I doing? Marcus, I mean, it's just, it was just a dog, but it's always just something, John. Just a wife, just a son, just a friend, just a house, just a car, just a dog, or just a cat. Each of these I've lost in no particular order. And each time the pain I felt was quite real. And my chosen reciprocity to each was no more and no less brutal than the other. John says, this isn't like me. Marcus responds with a smile and a nod. Maybe not, but for the rare men of our ilk, those who survived an arguably unsurvivable life, the few things we find time to care about pass long before we do. That just sounds very thought-provoking in terms of writing, and I and I felt like this would have added a lot more depth to both of these characters in the movie. It would have been cool to actually hear something like that in the movie. So it's from this point on that the script and the movie are pretty much far from identical from each other, and this is where the differences become a lot more prevalent in this case, from here until the end of this video. What happens from this point on is kind of weird. In the movie, he's told by Perkins to go straight to Vigo's stash, and he goes straight there to completely burn everything that's inside. In the script, he goes to a diner where he meets Vigo, and then he goes after him first, which is... I mean, I guess you want to kill the guy before you go for a stash, but in John Wick's case, he's trying to get revenge, so I feel like it would make more sense for him to go to the, the stash rather than go to Vigo first. I mean, it does lead to a fun little action scene. The guy who was guarding Vigo's stash was a priest in a church in the movie, and he ends up getting killed once everything gets burned down. In the script, it's just a bank manager. Not as interesting, but, you know, you gotta keep the money somewhere, I guess. So now we reach the finale of both the script and the movie. John goes after Vigo in order to find out where his son is, which he does in the movie too, but in this case, in the script, he actually at the verge of already killing Vigo after he tells him he arranged Yosef to a safe house in Moscow via a grain ship out of Newmark. And this is all while he's coughing and trembling and pretty much trying to gasp for air, barely holding on, as he knows he's about to die from any hit of a moment, which he does. Of course, John not caring much in the world, he goes after Yosef, where he's on the ship ready to disembark, but he catches it before it even leaves. So both the script and the movie, he approaches Yosef. In the movie, he just shoots him point blank and kills him pretty much instantly. In the script, Yosef dies actually much more brutally than he does in the, in the movie. I'm gonna go through word for word, and if you're squeamish in terms of violent content like this, you can skip to whatever time code that I show you, because it gets pretty violent from here, so just giving you that warning right now. But if you're still watching, here we go. John surges into the us, whose hand comes down with the letter opener. John catches his wrist and snaps it as his right hand darts up, constricts around Yasuf's jaw, cracking it in two, lifting him from the ground and hurling him into a pane of glass which explodes. Screaming, Yasuf tumbles end over end, his body slamming into chute, from which grain continues to pour. The hole closes to full. Yosef cartwheels over it and lands half in half out of the hole, snapping his back as around him, grains pile higher, and he sinks. No! Help me! No! <laughs> While his legs remain on deck, his upper torso sinks slightly. The grain covers his face muting his screams as he suffocates to death. Shit. <laughs> that is a harsh way to go. I would have just taken the bullet to the face, honestly. <laughs> this Yosef had it worse than the Yosef in the movie. Like, I mean, either way, you shouldn't fuck with his dog, but but wh whatever. That's That was on you, dude. So both the script and the movie wrap up, with John finally 
replacing his old dog with a new one. The only small difference is that he walks off into the night, and in the script he drives off into the night. It doesn't really matter that much, the movies both end kind of similar. And that's the end of my analysis, so here are my final thoughts. And now we've come to the end of the video where we where I finally come to the decision whether I like the script or if I like the movie. And I have to say, I'm kind of split. Now in this new video segment, and this being the first one in that segment, it's a little weird for me to come to this conclusion. Normally, because I was thinking that I would have to choose one or the other. But in this case, I, I really can't. On one hand, the script has a lot of qualities and a lot of entertainment value that sometimes the movie doesn't really have. But at the same time, the movie itself and how it's presented is still fantastic on its own. There are differences between the script and the movie that do kind of measure out uh, the qualities themselves, but it's because of those qualities that make them stand out individually. So even if you watch the movie on its own, you can still enjoy it for what it is. And if you read the script, you can also enjoy it for how it is but mainly because you watch the film. If you if you read the script on its own on its own merits without even really having any context or any clue as to what John Wick is, I don't know if you could enjoy it as much. But at the same time, you probably could. In hindsight, both the movie and the script has such a high quality and just a high standard that it's hard for me to say which one's better than the other because they're both that damn good. I never thought I'd actually come to that conclusion in the first video of this segment. Like, that's why it's very strange to me. Overall, I think you can enjoy this film and you can enjoy the script, reading them both at the same time, or just watching or reading them individually. Either way, like I said at the beginning of the video, you're gonna have a damn good time with it. I do recommend watching this movie and reading the script at the same time if you're up for it. That being said, that's the end of the video. If you tuned in for the whole thing, I thank you for doing so. And I hope you guys like the new segment that I made up. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video, hopefully. Take care of yourselves, and I hope you enjoyed this experiment.